At one time or another, most of us have probably watched crime shows on television, but have you ever thought about CSI for animals? Forensic scientists may be called in for abuse cases, a poisoning, a hoarding investigation, or dog fighting incident. On this episode of The Paul Report, we're joined by veterinary pathologist Dr. Adam Stern, who will share his expertise on veterinary forensics. So stay with us. Production for the Paul Report is made possible by Inyert Tire and Auto Center in Charleston and Mattoon. Inyert offers complete auto repair. Inyert Tire and Auto Center cares about our community and thanks you for being a responsible pet owner. More information at Inyert.com. Something really interesting is happening on this episode of the Paul Report. We are talking with Dr. Adam Stern from the University of Illinois College of Veterinary Medicine, and he's going to talk about pet CSI. I, somebody said we need to have the theme music and theme <laughs> song for CSI on this episode, but it is very interesting. I, I mean, how did you get involved in, in pet forensics? It just, and and is, this, is this a relatively new field? Well, for me, I got started back when I was actually doing my further training in pathology. So a lot of my work is, is post-mortem exams, sort of like how you see on some of the TV shows when, mm -hmm. when a human dies. I just do the animal version of it and tell you why the animal died. Um, and during my training, we got presented with a lot of these cruelty cases. And so it was just that exposure that really took me over the edge and I really got interested in the topic. Um, and it was in 2007 where veterinary forensics actually sort of took off and, and became more of a, a, a familiar term. Um, and it stemmed from the Michael Vick uh, NFL football player uh, animal dog fighting cases, um, which ironically didn't hmm. start off as, as an animal cruelty investigation, the dog fighting aspect. It actually stemmed from a drug charge of his cousin and then subsequently they um, searched the house where Michael Vick was at because that's where the cousin gave his address. And from there, it took off and actually mm. became a, a much larger um, until a federal investigation took place. So it's just been it's been building off of that uh, yep. off of that national case, yep, obviously. Yep. Um, speaking of you, what are your research interests when it comes to the the forensic sides of, of veterinary medicine? Well, there, the veterinary forensics is such a large field. Um, right now, a lot of my interests, I'm, I'm actually specializing in, in arson investigations, um, is sort of the, the pathway I'm taking right now. We're looking at um, sort of how we can further our diagnostic approach to arson cases, um, trying to figure out was arson really the cause of death or did something else happen to that animal before the fire actually happened. Hmm. Now, uh, veterinary forensics can involve what types of situations. It can be something, it's my understanding, it can be something where the animal is the, um, the animal is the, could be a witness, the animal could be the perpetrator, the animal could be the victim. Right. There's, there's a lot of different scenarios um, when it comes to, to this type of study. Talk about that. Yep, you're right. The, basically, you have the three categories, um, and usually, it's the animal is the the victim or potentially the perpetrator. You know, some a dog bites a child, and they want to make sure that dog actually is the one that bit the child. Um, a lot of it is the animal is the victim, um, and and you, you talked about the animal as a witness. And although these animals can't talk to us, we can actually use some of their genetic material. Um, cases have happened in the past where the perpetrator um, actually brushed up against a white cat in the house. And then they found white cat fur on the, the, the uh, suspect uh, clothing. And through genetic analysis, they actually put that person back mm. at the scene because of this white cat hair. Um, wow, and so you, you know, so they didn't say, the cat didn't tell you, oh, by the way, this person was there, but they had evidence on them that totally connected them. Um, mm -hmm. But for the most part, it's the animal is the victim. Um, and we basically break our, our cases down to really four main categories. Um, you have physical abuse, you have emotional abuse, um, y unfortunately you have sexual abuse, um, and, and then you have neglect. And basically neglect is going to be the, the biggest thing that we see, mm -hmm. just people failing to provide you know, food, water, appropriate shelter. And unfortunately that's, that's one of the biggest things that we see currently. So how do you get a case? Um, and, and maybe you could 
talk about, obviously without giving names, but maybe in, in those four categories, maybe you can talk about some examples of some things that have come through your office. But um, how, how are you presented with, with a case? Well, a number of different ways. So in, in Illinois, we have humane investigators who work w mostly with your local uh, humane societies. You have animal control officers, you have law enforcement, and then you have the general practitioner, the veterinarian who sees a, a case and, and is concerned that there might be abuse. And so really, any one of those people can, can give me a phone call and we start to work up the case and figure out what's the next step that needs to be done. Um, and, and so, for example, um, a couple of years ago, I had a case. The police uh, department called me and they said, hey, we have this case. Um, a suspect was caught in the house and the, there's a dead dog. And, and they had a lot of physical evidence um, at the scene su suggesting that there was a lot of um, mm. trauma going on there, lots of blood and everything else. Um, and it was through my interaction with them that we figured out exactly what happened. Um, and then the end result was that the guy did go to jail. Um, he did get, I think, three years in jail. So there, there is a consequence to what some of these people do. Um, for me, I'm not the judge or the jury. You know, that's not my job. I'm just going to tell you the facts, and this is what happened, and this is how I think it happened. Um, and then it will go through the court system, sort of like any other crime. Um, you know, if somebody gets murdered, it's the same process, except we substitute the human being for an animal. Are you ever called to testify in court for, for cases? I am. Or I am. Um, I've gone to, you know, various courts. Um, a lot of times, you know, you go to court and then two minutes before you go on trial, stand trial um, to be a witness and everything, mm -hmm. um, they plea out. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it's just because they don't think everybody's going to show up or they, they, f they know they're guilty and they just figure out it's better to do this now than to have a, a, greater, a greater charge um, with penalties later on. Back to those four categories, can you talk about some scenarios that have come through your office? Um, some of them may be graphic, so you may want to avoid that, but maybe just in general to help our viewers kind of understand, um, it, you know, the broad topic is this, but this right. is what it means. It was a dog that, you know, was malnourished or whatever. So on, on the neglect, um, uh, a lot of times, especially with the economic downturn, a lot of people were forced to move out of their houses, whether they were foreclosed or they had to go to another city. And unfortunately, leaving a pet behind. Um, they leave them in the house or leave them in a kennel or, or whatnot on the property, and nobody's there to feed, feed them or give them water. And so unfortunately, these animals suffer throughout that time period, and eventually they, they do succumb um, to starvation. And so um, they would call me, and we would basically have to sort of rule out you know, natural diseases and other things that could have led to this animal's death. Um, and then from there they go ahead and, you know, they might get lucky and the person has a forwarding address on their mailbox. And so they know exactly, you know, who, who, who it is and, and where they've went so they can track them down. Mm -hmm. um, for physical abuse, it could be as simple as somebody kicking a dog or, you know, shooting a dog um, and, and mm -hmm. you know, them dying. Um, you know, we get police shootings and you know you'll have the police say that this is a clean shoot because the dog was coming towards me you have the owner saying no the dog wasn't coming towards them the dog was going away and so I can look at this animal and figure out well was the dog actually coming towards this police officer or not and sort of support one theory and refute another um, so those are sort of the cases that we see and it's it's a little bit of science um, a lot of observation um, can go into it we get cases that are much more complicated um, I've worked on cases where there's a suspect poisoning and we have to get toxicologists involved and figure out what toxin was actually used to poison the animals. Wow. I, so uh, the autopsies are much like, am I correct in saying it, much like a human autopsy. It's, it's treated as, as such. Is every case, I mean, I'm sure you have to investigate every case. Is that, is that accurate? Yep. No, it's, it's much like a human autopsy with the, with the difference right. of the animal. Um, you know, we s use the same tools, we use the same procedures, um, you know, modify them. We still look at tissues under a microscope. Um, so we do everything that you would do um, as, a, as a, a medical doctor pathologist, MD pathologist. Um, just, just different situations, typically. Most interesting case that has come through your office. Maybe most interesting and the most difficult. Um, the, the most difficult and, and the most interesting sort of come together. Um, it's, it's the cases that actually where there's a, a, a homicide involved with the animal death. 
Um, and so you might have sort of, I call them two, two murders or two homicides where the person's killed and the dog is killed. And then, you know, taking all that evidence and putting it together, and maybe the dog might have evidence, uh, more of an evidence of a weapon that was used than, than the person or vice versa. So it's, it's you know, much more complicated, um, multiple people getting involved and, and connecting all the dots. When you get a case like that, you know, and we'll go back to the TV shows, they're solved in an hour, <laughs> you know. Uh, how, what is the normal, you know, caseload for you and how long does it take? I don't know if solve is the right word, but it's not something that can be decided upon overnight, I'm, I'm sure. Is that accurate? Oh, that's totally accurate. <laughs> you, you look at the TV shows, you know, <laughs> You one probably hour. shake your head at night when you're watching me. <laughs> <laughs> one hour with commercials, uh, I can't even do an exam in an hour. Um, my typical exam will take a couple of hours just to look at the animal, and that's just looking at it. That's not processing, you know, looking at the microscope and sending all the other samples out to, to get help from other labs, potentially. Um, so I would say um, from start to finish of my final report, I don't solve the case. That's what the police officers do. Um, usually four to six weeks. Um, in, a, in a standard case um, for a turnaround time. So it doesn't happen overnight. Um, you know, a lot of work goes into it behind the scenes that you don't see. You know, mm -hmm. the TV shows, you know, they put a, a, a piece of tissue in a, in a vial, and within five minutes, not even that, they just turn their, to the other side of the set, and they have an answer of what poison was kill, used to kill the person. And it just doesn't happen that way at all. No. Do you see, uh, you know, I think when we think of animal forensics, we go to cats and dogs, but do you, are there other animals that maybe you're called in, maybe reptiles or anything like that that you've been called in to, to look at or to investigate? Most of it, you're right, is cats, dogs. Um, recently, you know, I've had a couple of, of horse cases, um, whether they're, you know, sort of mass starvation cases of 20 or 30 horses that aren't fed, um, cattle, um, you know, even even poultry like chickens. I mean, they're all they're all they're all abused in, in various different ways. Um, and then the reptile thing. Um, I'm not a reptile expert, and so there are actually very few experts in veterinary forensic medicine in general. But there's actually one or two who all they do is reptiles. And so if, if I ever got a case, I would be sending it to them right away because that's that's not my area, and I believe that it should go to the expert in that field. And so I would actually recommend then. Talk to sure. them about it. Mostly what comes yeah. through your office, though, are dogs. And Mostly dogs, cats, and, and horses would be the, mm -hmm. the big three. You know, I found it interesting, too, that when we talk about veterinary forensics, that it does involve other disciplines, um, other scientists, if you will. Uh, how do, can you talk about how that, maybe how your area is married with, with other folks and how that plays in? And um, I just th I found that very interesting when you're doing your 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 work. So um, you know, obviously the, the veterinary pathologist it, we're sort of in charge of the case, and then um, in cases of suspected poisonings, we'll consult with toxicologists and let them run their chemical analysis of the tissues mm -hmm. and everything, figure it out. Um, entomology is another big field who I do consult with a lot, and so entomology is really cool because we can figure out sort of. The, the time when this animal had died, okay? So we can take the bugs, like the maggots and stuff like that we might find on the body, and we can look at them and figure out how long it took them to grow that certain, that certain size. And from that, we just backtrack and figure out the animal has been dead for at least this long. Sort of giving us a time frame, and it might be useful for somebody's alibi um, or pla just placing a suspect potentially at that scene. Um, botany is the same way. You know, you can use a, a, a weed growing on top of an animal and age it and give it a time frame. So there's a lot of cool stuff out there. A lot of it's thinking outside the box, something that you wouldn't think would be useful, you know, forensically related in a normal case. You might come across a case where you might have to use that. Uh, take me inside your lab. So when you get a case, what exactly is the process? And do you have assistance in your in your lab that kind of go through that, or maybe vet students that are training alongside of you. But when you get a case, t take me there. So if I get a case, um, I usually, um, there's technicians who receive the case for me and you know, we get all the paperwork done. Um, once I'm out there um, and I, I perform the, the, we call them necropsies instead of autopsies. Once I perform my exam, 
um, there'll be technicians who are helping me, you know, sort of collecting tissues and sort of helping me on the sidelines to, to get everything I need. Um, from there, um, and that's looking at the gross specimen, from there we, we make little microscope slides. And so we take small pieces of each tissue, prepare them and, and put them on slides so I can look at them on a microscope. And, and from all that information, come up with my, my thoughts and, and reports. When you're at a scene, do you also pick up substances that might be around the deceased animal? Is that something that also helps in, in your process? Those would be helpful, but usually that goes to more of the, the, the crime scene investigators who are there. They're going to be the evidence collectors at a scene. For me, being at a scene, I just I sort of take a step back, look at the animal, maybe help them if we're exhuming an animal, what's the best way to get this 2,000-pound horse out of the ground. Um, so things like that. I'm more of a sort of a, a consultant on the side. Um, I'm not truly involved in, in collecting all the samples. Um, and unfortunately, um, unlike human forensic medicine, you know, where, where you have the pathologist and they, they're always at the scene, we rarely get invited to the scene. And so there's this sort of disconnect with us from the scene itself. Um, I get invited more and more now, um, but for a long time, you know, I would never be at the scene at all. Um, and we just rely on pictures and, and sort of written reports from the police and whoever is involved. Going back to it, when you mentioned really pet forensics really came on the scene back in 2007 and, and it's really that's been when you've started following it and been involved in it. Can you talk about, I, I guess my question is how, how severe, if that's even the right word, is really um, violence towards animals? Um, you see a lot of it and it's probably not something that people out there no, unless they hear somebody like you say, you really don't understand that there are a lot of cases like this out there. Is that something since, I wouldn't say the inception, but in the last several years that that's something that's, that's widespread? Yeah, well, there's, there's an association between uh, abuse of animals and abuse of, of children and, and women. Um, there's definitely reports out there that, that do um, sort of make that connection or show that these might be predictive factors um, animal abuse being a predictive factor um, to potentially doing spousal abuse or, or somewhat a form of abuse. Um, so those things are out there. Back in early 2000s, there was a, a period of time, 2001, 2004 in Chicago actually, um, where they, they looked at um, a group of people who were arrested for um, spousal abuse and they found that a large percentage of them actually um, abused animals or had made inclinations to abuse an animal. So you can see there's a connection. Um, and, and so it's, it's more prevalent than we think. Um, you might see a dog walking down the street and, and you would not know it's abused just by looking at it. But if you, you delve into it, it potentially could be. And uh, again, what, what sort of things when you go through, if you, if you get an animal that comes to your office where you can't visually see anything, is that when the tissue tests come into play, the blood test, or how do you, like you said, if there's if it's really nothing you can see, yeah. uh, how do you how do you determine? It, it's for me a lot of it is you. I have to use my eyes, and just because I don't see anything externally wrong, doesn't mean when I I look at this animal that I don't see rib fractures. Because maybe it happened months ago, um, but if I see a pattern of rib fractures, um, that that sort of sort of sets things off that there's been trauma to this animal, and let's try to figure out well, what happened. Um, the same thing if you're a, a, a practitioner working in a veterinary clinic. Um, you might be presented with a case and the history doesn't make sense. You know, maybe you say this, the animal comes in and obviously it's very injured. Um, and maybe the owner says, hey, my dog fell down the stairs. And then you talk to them a little bit later, oh, the dog fell off the deck. And so stuff isn't adding up. And so mm -hmm. little clues like that might be all you need to sort of investigate the, the abuse a little bit more. Where do you see um, currently the, the topic of veterinary forensics at veterinary schools across the country? Is it something that is becoming more prevalent and something that we're going to be seeing more, um, you know, uh, uh, pet forensics come into play at, 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 med sc or at vet schools? You're going to see it. It's up and coming. Um, right now, there's about five veterinary schools that, that have elective courses. Nobody has as a core course yet, 
Um, but we have an elective course. The University of Illinois has an elective course, um, and a couple of other universities do as well. And, and, and basically, we walk our students through um, all sorts of cases, you know, things that you could think are unimaginable. We talk to them about it and prepare them for it because they are going to see it in the real world. Um, it's not just these paper cases, we make this stuff up, it, it's real. Um, and so we're really preparing them for the real world. Um, and you know, with time, you're going to see it more and more. Um, you, can, you can search online right now and, and, and find people who do it. But we're a small group of people. I think in the next 10, 15 years, there's going to be a lot more. Um, and, and since we're, it's sort of in its infancy now, um, we're just going to grow and grow from here. And how many students do you work with at the University of Illinois that, that really seem to be drawn to this, to this topic? A small handful are, are really like, this is really cool stuff and I want to do this. Um, my course that I teach, we teach about 15, 20 students um, a, in, a, in a fall semester. But all the students do get exposed to it throughout their curriculum. And so, you know, even if they're not into it like this is really exciting stuff, we're making them aware. And, and really that's all you have to be is aware of it because, you know, you come to a case and something doesn't make sense. I'm happy with you realizing that it doesn't make sense and, and then you go and investigate it from there. Do you see the, the, the marriage between local law enforcement, somebody like yourself, and maybe coroners developing over time as, as, this, as this topic blossoms? Oh, I, I see that marriage and I see it, I see it it's going to blossom. Um, it's, it's always interesting when I talk to a police officer and it's their first animal cruelty case. And, and a lot of times they say, hey doc, I have no clue how to tell you this, but I have my first cat murder and I don't know what to do. Um, and, and so we talk about it and, and we talk about how, so to just treat it the same way. Mm -hmm. um, and then once I say that, they're like, oh yeah, that, you know, that totally makes sense. And, and then they feel comfortable again even though it's an animal. And so it's, it's just a little bit of education, everybody working back and forth with each other. And, and it, it just goes really smoothly from there. But I think you know, with time, you know, there's gonna be a much bigger system um, mm -hmm. to approaching these cases. All right, well, Dr. Stern, thank you so much for sharing your insight and knowledge and very interesting topic that uh, I, I hadn't, really, hadn't really considered until I started doing a little bit of topic research and came across it, and I thought, this is really interesting. So thank you so much for joining us on this episode of The Paw Report. Well, thank you for having me. It's been fun. If you are a veterinarian, trainer, groomer, specialist, rescue organization, or shelter that would like to partner with the Paul Report by providing expert guests for the show, please contact us by emailing weiu at weiu.net or call 217-581-5956. If you have a topic you'd like to see on the show or questions for our experts, contact us with those too. some pet news you can use. When a Louisiana family hatched ducks, they were in for a bit of a surprise. Meet Donald, the four-legged duck. The poor guy has a little trouble getting around with his extra limbs, but his vet says he's healthy. But Donald will need daily physical therapy to make sure his good leg will work properly. The family raising him has raised and hatched more than a thousand ducks, but never one quite like Donald. They Everybody's like, oh wow, I've never seen that. They think it's cool. They're like, that's so special, because he is. We think he's special. Donald's family says he will make regular visits to his vet to make sure he stays healthy. He even has his own Facebook page. Did you know full episodes of The Paul Report are on YouTube? They can be accessed at www.youtube.com slash weiutv. Then just go to The Paul Report playlist and select the episode you want to see. More information about the show is available 24-7 on our website at weiu.net under the television tab. Have a video or photo of your pet doing something funny or absolutely adorable? We'd love to share it with our viewers here at the Paul Report. Email it to weiu at weiu.net and you can see it on our show. Just make sure it's video taken by you or that you have permission to share it. For more information about how to get that video or photo to us, email or call 217-581-5956.
Production for the Paul Report is made possible by Inyert Tire and Auto Center in Charleston and Mattoon. Inyert offers complete auto repair. Inyert Tire and Auto Center cares about our community and thanks you for being a responsible pet owner. More information at Inyert.com.